And so we're going to be in Acts chapter 27 tonight, and there's a particular story there that's going to help us tie in our theme for the weekend, and let me introduce us to that since we are at this point. The theme is renew, renewal, and we're going to read and dissect in just a second a scenario where real renewal was needed. But why is the theme of renewal important for us to come around this weekend and to think about? Not only this weekend, but throughout our entire Christian journeys. Why is it so important? Why would this leadership team be led to think about this theme of renewal? Well, first of all, it is a very important theme all throughout Scripture. If God himself felt like it was important enough to talk to us over and over about renew, renewal, then I think we better pay attention to it. One that you may remember the most familiar, perhaps, is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 30 and 31. If you remember there, it says, even youths grow weary and tired, but those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will regain new strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Man, there are some days lately with that darn dissertation of mine (laughs) and other trials in life or tears running down my face. I'm like, I will run and not grow weary. I'll walk and not grow faint because God knows that we get tired and weary. Even young, strong people, you get tired and weary, but he gives us an outlet there. He says, if you wait on me, I'll renew your strength, girlfriend. And so that's where we pick up here in the text. So they are going to Caesar. The The Lord has met with Paul, and he said, you will testify in Rome for me as you have done in Jerusalem. And that's where we are when this scene picks up. And it says here in chapter 27, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy. Now that we passage is Luke, his companion. He's traveling with him. And so um, that's where we get the we. That's a little bit his autograph there and in the book of Luke. That's how we know. Um, This is Luke writing. So when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. Okay, so it's Paul and some other prisoners that were there in Caesarea. And so now uh, they are um, all going to be traveling together to Rome on this ship. And embarking in the Adoramission ship, which was about to sail for the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. Okay, so there, it's a giant merchant ship, most likely probably um, carrying grain of some sort or wheat. You could carry up to 800 tons of wheat on this kind of ship. If you read longer, you realize, we won't get to it tonight, but there's somewhere around a little over 200 people on this journey. And so you have a merchant ship where also prisoners could be put on. If someone wants to get to the next port, they can get put on there. As you see, so it's a mixture of people being put on this ship. The next day, verse 3, we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. Don't miss that about St. Paul. All throughout his letters, we see him have such favor with people. Sometimes he doesn't win with us with a 21st century worldview because we think he's kind of harsh towards women. But to that, I have to say, you have to read him in his full counsel and really study him hard to realize that is not him. But he has such favor. He's such a connector. So he is able, even as a prisoner, to go and be with his friends and receive care. Don't miss that about Paul. He's my man. I love Paul. Verse 4, from there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Notice that. The winds were contrary. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphyla, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard. So again, they're just looking for opportunity to put them on the ship and go forward. Verse 7, When we had sailed, listen, sailed slowly for a good many days with difficulty. Pay attention to these details that begin to arise. With difficulty. Had arrived off Nidus since the wind did not permit us to go farther. We sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salome. And with difficulty, there it is again, with difficulty, sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. When considerable time had passed, so this is not a short voyage, the voyage was, listen, now dangerous. Since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. Now, when it says the fast there, it's this this referencing a day of atonement. So probably the time between September and around October, right where we are right now in the season. These merchant ships would not sail, even because of the winter storms, they would not sail between November and mid-March. 
So what we're going to see here is a scenario building where as it gets difficult and as the winds begin to pick up, it's going to become a situation where there's no other merchant ships out there. So if they get into trouble, they on their own. That's what Luke is trying to build us up to know at this time. So Paul begins to admonish them, verse 10, and he says to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss. Not only of the cargo in the ship, but also of our own lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there if somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. When a moderate south wind came up, supposing that they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete close inshore. So the first point, I want us to bring that up, where we might be tonight, why we might need renewal. We have a scenario building of one that could be of potential defeat, feeling defeated. Can you imagine, put yourself in this own scenario as we read through this tonight. You may not have necessarily go through a physical storm, although we know very much living in this area what that is like, do we not? So you might go through a physical storm, but it may be a metaphor, metaphorical storm, a different kind of storm in your life just tonight. I got a text right before coming up that one of my very dear friend's husbands passed away exactly my age. They're going through a storm, that kind of storm, and there is a potential for defeat coming up in a way that we need renewal. It begins slowly, and then there is with difficulty. And some of us may have come here this weekend with either or that we see here happening at the end of this first section in verse 13. Because you see, on one hand, we might be like Paul. And I'm not saying that he felt necessarily defeated, but we can feel defeated when we do have wisdom. I do think that Paul was actually very good at sailing. I think I see a nautical theme that runs through at least 1 Timothy with some of the wordings that he uses. After I finish my dissertation, another baby I want to do is a nautical theme that runs through 1 Timothy. He knows what he's talking about. He has wisdom. He stands up and he tells them they ought not to do this. But what happens? They listen to the majority opinion. And some of us may have come in this weekend and you do have wisdom and you have been telling people in your life, whether that's a child, your husband, your boss, you actually know what you're talking about. You're not trying to be a jerk. You're not trying to to be a know-it-all, but you actually have shared wisdom even with kindness. And yet they have still chosen to listen to another voice or the voice of the world and we can feel defeated in that way. Or perhaps you're on the other side, and you have been the one that has been given the wisdom. You have been the one that wise people were pouring into you, and you decided still to go with the majority decision and follow the way of the world or just follow a lesser way, and that can lead, like we're going to see, to a scenario of defeat because I didn't listen to the wisdom of the one who knew whether that is the Lord, number one, or other people just pouring into your life. We can come and just feel defeated on one or the other, because is anybody listening to me? No, you are. I just meant we might. (laughs) Well, hey, I'm glad that you are. I'm glad that you are. Do you know what I mean? I meant we feel that way. Does anybody hear me? Is anybody listening? I know that you are. Okay. Now listen here. You got to love Paul. Watch what happens. When they had gone a long time without food, Then Paul stood up in their midst. I love that Luke includes this in the story. Men, you ought to have followed my advice (laughs) and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Now, we might not want to be that when that prodigal comes back or whoever, you know. Uh, You should have listened to me, boys, but you didn't. But here's what's going to happen. But I love Paul. Um, because he's just honest, you know, Uh, but he says that you should have listened to me, but you didn't. But verse 22, now I urge you to keep up your courage for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Now remember, remember, well, let me go on. I'll come back to this. For this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve stood before me. Now that's very important because remember, this is a multi-God culture. So he says, the God whom I belong to and whom I serve, he's pointing that out to really hone in on the one true God, okay? The one true God's going to save this ship, just like with Jonah and just like in our lives. No other God, the one true God of heaven. Okay, so that's very important. Verse 24, 
And the angel stood before him and saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. But God granted you all those that were sailing with you. Do you remember at the beginning of the story when Paul said, we're going to lose life and you're going to lose cargo. But through this whole thing, Paul has been interceding. He never stopped. He says, God has granted you these men, Paul. I believe Paul was interceding. Do we intercede when we're defeated, when we're depleted? I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep praying. But in this scenario, Paul has this promise from the angel. Now, you and I necessarily, you may have met with an angel. The Lord may have make that happen in today's time as well. But very often, you and I both know that there are times the Lord speaks something to your heart, and you feel like you can hold on to that. Perhaps a child um, maybe will return. You don't know when. You don't know where. But God has given you that, and you hold on to that. In my own life, uh, not... Kay Arthur, but her assistant Kay, we were talking earlier about me being single at 36 years old. There, uh, She said, are you content being single? I'm like, yes, I'm very content because she said I'd stay single <laughs> in this day and age. But I said, here's the thing. I am very content, but there have been in numerous moments where the Lord has spoken a word directly to me, pray for your husband about this, pray for him about this. So there's been so many peculiar moments about my husband that I almost can't deny that that might be a reality, you know, but, but I joke that I often live like um, first Samuel, you know, when, when Samuel's looking through Jesse's sons uh, to find David and he, and the Lord's like, no, not the one, not the one, not the one, you know, I'm like, Lord, where's David? Where's my David? And like every guy I date, he's like, no, no. I'm like, okay. But still, but listen, but sometimes, I got to wrap up because I'm probably over my time, but sometimes our emotions, our own minds, we can't always just rely on that. You've got to test everything you think you hear from the Lord with the word. Very often, if I think I've heard something from the Lord, it always aligns with his word. It's not just some random crazy thing. It aligns with his word. So there's that. However, so we do have promises where we can stand up by the, like, the, like Paul did and said, I believe it will happen just like God said. But we don't have to rely on those promises that come in the spirit because we have a whole book full of promises. We have the word of God. And there are so many promises given there even before, um, before this. When Paul is giving his account in chapter 26, oh gosh, I think it's 26, yes, he is proclaiming um, the promise that, it, that was given to the Jews and trying to proclaim and says, man, men, this is the fulfillment of the promise when he's on trial. And what is that promise? He quotes the words of Jesus here. This is Jesus who says this. Um, I will rescue you from the Jewish people, from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. Verse 18. Listen, this is Jesus. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That's a promise that you will be transferred from the dominion of Satan. You'll be transferred into the darkness, from darkness to light, Colossians chapter one. Nothing has been made that has been made without his knowledge or through him, by him all things have been made. The very fact that you exist means that you have value because you were made through him. You were made through him, and he gives you that promise. And he said in 1 John chapter 4, 4, greater is, you that it, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's a promise. I could go on and on, but I'm probably already past my time. And so I just want to say you need to Google and look up for yourselves all the promises given throughout Scripture. And when you feel defeated and you feel depleted, you get back on your knees and you fight for that. And the next point is determined. The final point, you become determined. Determined to hold on to those promises so that you get the renewal that Jesus promises that you will have. When I was a college volleyball player at Florida Southern, any other Florida Southern alums? Oh, go Mox in the room. Yes, just down the road from here. I love Florida State, but I am a Florida Southern alum. When I was there, I was a volleyball player, and I played volleyball most of my life, was an all-American volleyball athlete, loved the game very, very much. And I'll never forget this one day when um, we were in practice in this drill that we do as a defensive player. I was a defensive player. And so let's say that this is the baseline of the court, and my coach is up at the net 40 feet in front of me. And um, 
he would tip the ball or throw the ball this way or whatever, and I have to run and go get it and get it up, run and turn the touch the baseline, and as soon as you've turned around, he's already thrown the next one. You either go for a minute or 20 touches or something because you can't last much more than a minute in that. It's like called the pit. It's a gut drill. You're just wanting to throw up. You're so tired from it. But this day, I just got it in me. I'm like, I'm going to do this drill unlike anybody has ever seen this drill done. And I am going all out, and I am just laying it all on the court. And one of my coaches from Puerto Rico, she was a big Puerto Rican national player, amazing woman. She saw this happening, and she came over just like this, and I'll never forget, and she got down like this, and she's watching me do this drill. And she, I'm about to vomit. I'm working so hard, right? I'm just going. <laughs> and all of a sudden, she starts to say, now this is a volleyball player. Now this is a volleyball player. This is a volleyball player. And do you know, even recently in my life, there came a moment not that long ago when I was just feeling all these things, defeated, depleted, laid out. And I was like, you know what, Lord, I'm going to get on my knees one more time. And I got on my knees, and usually at night when I pray, I put on a hoodie or I get under the covers. I cover my head, just respect for the Lord. And I don't know that you have to do that. I just, I, that's my practice. But listen, I'm under those covers, and I'm weeping. And I'm crying out to God about every single thing that's going on in my life and all the storm that's just raging in me. And my boat is just being carried along. And I'm telling him, do you know what? That picture came back to my mind of the volleyball court that day. And Dee's voice saying, this is a volleyball player. This is a volleyball player. And I heard the Lord say to me, now that's a Christian. Now that's a Christian. Now that's a Christian. That's what my girl does. That's what my girl does. So this weekend, you're going to hear the Lord say that to you. Now that's a Christian. That's a Christian. You can get back up and keep pursuing him and call out like Paul did. To finish up, and then the wonderful Miss K. Arthur is going to come. But tonight and this whole weekend, I, I, I felt I saw this visual from the Lord. And I, I never practiced it in front of people, so bear with me here. <laughs> but I felt like a lot of us may have come in this weekend just feeling like um, I'm out in the battle. You know, I'm exhausted, I'm on my back, I'm tired, I'm, I'm defeated, I'm out, I'm depleted. And it seems to me that we have a choice before us this weekend that you have what God calls in Ephesians 6, the sword of the Spirit on one hand, laying there ready for you to take it up. Or on the other hand, you have all these things going on in your life, the defeat, the deplete. And we have to choose this weekend. If I'm laid on my back and I'm tired in the battle, Lord, and I'm laying in my bed at night just wondering about these things, am I going to get my grip around this sword? Or am I going to continue to let these things over here rule my life? But this weekend, with me and with Kay, I'm going to take up this sword. And we're going to grip this sword. And we're going to get back up on our knees. And we are going to be determined. And we're going to be determined. King Jesus, thank you so much for this word, Lord. <laughs> to you be the glory, to you be the honor, to you be the fruit. Let it plant it deep down in the hearts of all of us here. And we're going to walk out changed, Lord. We want to love you more and more and more every day till we see you face to face. I give you the glory and praise, Jesus. Increase it as you will in your name. Amen.